Part two of my in-depth story about literary great Dorothy Parker. We reflect on her years as an Oscar-winning old Hollywood screenwriter, plus her late-in-life Jewish awakening that led her to being a vocal advocate against the rise of Nazism, and what she did for young Jewish immigrants fleeing the Holocaust. For its own crowning event, the annual Academy Awards. In 1934, the bright lights of Hollywood came calling, and Dorothy Parker embarked on a whole new chapter. Dorothy penned some of the most famous original MGM and Technicolor movies during the time of Wizard of Oz. She won an Academy Award for the original Star is Born, later remade by Judy Garland, and a soon-to-be-released remake starring Lady Gaga and Bradley Cooper. She was one of the founders of the Writers Guild, yet was blacklisted during the McCarthy era. She had a thick FBI file, and J. Edgar Hoover had agents following her. But a determined Dorothy only continued to find her sole calling to right the world's wrongs. Best of the actual pictures from Spain in revolt, Gilmont British News tells a graphic story of bloodshed and violence. She went to Spain to fight alongside the Loyalists during the Civil War at the time of Ernest Hemingway. She had a very, very strong attachment to social justice. I mean, she went to Spain and witnessed the Spanish Civil War in the 1930s. She saw the bombing in Madrid. She saw what, the, what was happening to the poor in Spain. That really, really struck her. And so she wrote about that, and she told American people about that. That's how she became so friendly with Hemingway, is because Hemingway was very vocal as well, too. So they, very, they worked very closely on telling Americans what was happening in Spain. And from there, her political activism became a personal soul calling. Around the age of 40, she had her Jewish awakening, hellbent on waking up the world to the horrors of the rise of Hitler and Nazism. Women slave workers went through the hell of German domination in conditions scarcely fit for beasts. She was a loud and proud member of the Hollywood Anti-Nazi League and campaigned for FDR. At that time, Americans didn't really know that the Holocaust was going on as much as we would think about today. Um, but as refugees start coming to the United States, Dorothy Parker wants to do something. So she did reach in her own pocket and pay for some of those poor immigrant kids who came over here to have a summer education, go to summer camp, go up to Maine and Rhode Island and upstate New York. In Hollywood, for the first time, Dorothy had stability and happiness with her husband and co-writer, Alan Campbell. He doted on her. She had no domestic skills. She couldn't cook. She couldn't do laundry. Um, so Alan did all of that, took care of her finances. Tragedy struck again when Campbell died in 1963 of apparent suicide or a possible drug overdose. She once again found herself alone. Most of her friends were long gone. It was then that she moved back to New York as a senior citizen where she was taken under the wing of famous heiress and fashion icon Gloria Vanderbilt and her husband, writer Wyatt Cooper, a dear friend from their Hollywood days. They are the parents of CNN's Anderson Cooper. Fitzpatrick says they were Parker's dearest friends until she died of natural causes causes in June of 1967. Anderson Cooper was born um, right around the same time that Dorothy Parker passed away in June 1967, and that's why Gloria Vanderbilt couldn't go to Dorothy's funeral, that she was home with baby Anderson. And the funny thing is, is the dress that Dorothy Parker wore at her funeral was a gift from Gloria Vanderbilt, a very fashionable gold dress. In a twisted sense of fate, or perhaps a cosmic joke, exactly. Dorothy is literally laughing in her grave. Her cremated remains were left in an urn, hidden and lost for decades. Martin Luther King had died years before. In her will, if King died, then her estate and ashes would go to the NAACP in Baltimore. And today, her memory and legacy are forever embedded in the bedrock of the civil rights movement that she championed since the 1920s. I don't think Dorothy Parker will ever go out of fashion because what she wrote was not ephemeral. She wrote about the human condition. So getting her heart broken in 1918, it's the same as 2018. You know, a bad relationship back then, it's the same as having a bad relationship today. Perhaps Dorothy Parker was ahead of her time, but she was born that way. Hey. What? I just want to take another look at you. No doubt her genius and talent are a timeless treasure that influences even the biggest superstars of today. And uh, Carmita is here uh, with more on the mark she left. And I happen to speak to the lawyer for the NAACP saying that he gets requests 
all the time and how relevant she still is. Are you surprised? Not at all. You know, when I, you know, we both lived in New York, yeah. and I, I found out about it pretty much after I moved there. And to go to the Algonquin and sit at actual at the actual table and think about George S. Kaufman and and Harper Marx and, and Harpo all those brilliant Marx. minds, it's something that today is like something that I kind of yearn for to yeah. sit with the intellectuals, even though later in her life she sort of downsized them yeah, a little bit she, yeah. when she was, uh, but towards the end. But at the time, it was so exciting to, to, to live in a time with minds such as hers. And, and where the literary figures were giants. Like, those were the names that people, people knew. And those were the names that got famous because there were all these journalists and, and you know, they, that's where the New Yorker and started. Fake, and, and it wasn't fake news then. <laughs> exactly. God help us. You know, what other thoughts, you know, I mean, in learning all about the stuff she did for the, you know, in Spain and also during the Holocaust, FDR, all of this. Is this stuff that you knew when you heard She just her? didn't. You know, I did not. Because you're left People with her famous quotes, you know. Yeah, she didn't even, I mean, her father didn't, who was not in love with his own Judaism mm -hmm. as well as she didn't. And, and, and I think, you know, the whole Hollywood anti-Nazi anti league, she also, uh, she was fighting for, as you said, the, the, the Spanish war. She was in Madrid. She saw what was happening there. And she brought awareness to, yeah. to Hollywood and New York. And it's so sad that the FBI sort of took that as if it's an affront to communism. And that's why the studio is black listed her. Yeah, her name's on a lot of things that people uh, are not aware but, of. But, you know, all the, her quotes and there, there's there's so much feminism in that four, she was like, did you know she was two months pre premature? She was born yes, two months premature? She was, and during a hurricane. She was so during tiny. a hurricane. Yeah, during a hurricane. And <laughs> right so that just Labor makes Day. sense that this woman would shape our world and be prevalent today as she was back then. Thanks, Carmine.